Well, welcome to the IPM and Healthcare Facilities webinar series and our first webinar today, which is Common Sense Strategies for Preventing and Solving Rodent Problems. My name is Dr. Tom Green and I've been a consultant to the IPM and Healthcare Facilities Project since 2006. Some of you might recognize me even though I'm not wearing my knee pads from walkthroughs I've conducted at your facility. Wanted to let you know that we welcome questions and if you have them, um, just jot them down and then use the link at the end of the presentation uh, and we will uh, respond to those uh, personally and confidentially. Next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about the IPM and Healthcare Facilities Project. It's a project of the Maryland Pesticide Education Network and our goal is to promote defined integrated pest management to reduce pesticide use and impacts in Maryland healthcare facilities to protect high risk populations. So we've been working with healthcare facilities in the Maryland area since 2006, providing free consultation educational services, including walkthroughs of your facilities where we identify pest problems and conducive conditions for pest problems uh, and provide a detailed report with recommendations on how to eliminate those problems for the long term rather than just treating them, uh, treating the symptoms with pesticides. So our, our focus is on non-chemical pest prevention through good housekeeping and maintenance with least toxic pesticides used only as a last resort. Next slide. So I lead the project team's initial walkthrough of the facility to assess pest problems. So we do these initial walkthroughs. It gives us a real sense of what's going on uh, and where our problems and priorities need to be. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we return a report with detailed recommendations. And then we can support that with regular on-site visits to help you implement those. We also provide a bi-monthly newsletter uh, and a quarterly uh, pest management vendor log reviews. So we can tell a lot about what's going on uh, by looking uh, at the reports that your pest management service provider leaves behind uh, and can make recommendations based on that. So we provide this free consultation for both uh, indoor uh, and outdoor pest issues uh, to facilitate your transition to a defined IPM program uh, and policy, uh, meaning that you're, you're following standards for least toxic pest control. So we work with hospitals for a number of important reasons. So hospitals uh, contain vulnerable groups of people, uh, infants and children, pregnant women, fetuses, the elderly, people with compromised immune and nervous systems, those with asthma or respiratory problems, cancer patients and survivors, and those sensitive to chemicals. So these vulnerable groups are vulnerable not only to pesticides, but also to pests. So pests are associated with uh, pathogens uh, and can cause disease in humans. So very important that you have a good pest management program and that pest problems are few and far between. Next slide. So we promote a defined IPM approach. IPM is a systems approach to pest management. Uh, and we really focus on long-term prevention and suppression of pest problems. So we ask ourselves, why is the pest there? Uh, and we try to resolve that. And you'll see that in our presentation about rodents. Uh, and we focus on best practices like regular monitoring for pest problems as well as conditions that can encourage pest problems. Uh, thorough site inspections on a regular basis so that you identify maintenance issues before they become larger issues and invite pests into your facilities. And then educating your staff 
Um, as you'll hear, your maintenance and housekeeping staff are really your front line of pest prevention. And it's really important that your staff understand the importance of their role uh, and can perform uh, that role comfortably. It doesn't mean more work, uh, but it means understanding what the work that they're doing currently has to do with pest management uh, and how they can contribute to long-term pest prevention. And then we use structural, uh, mechanical, cultural, and biological controls uh, as our first line of defense uh, before uh, using other pesticides as a last resort. So as you'll hear, our IPM strategies are really focused in identifying and eliminating those conditions that enable pests to survive. Next slide. So big message here, don't tolerate rodents in your facility. It is possible to have a rodent free facility uh, and we can help you accomplish that. Really important. So many times uh, I work with facilities or people in homes uh, who've been dealing with ongoing rat or mouse problems for years. Uh, and they've, they've complained, they've reported, uh, they've had people come in uh, to try to treat the problem without success. Uh, and after a while, you just get tired of reporting and end up living with it. You don't have to do that. And it's really important that we don't do that. Um, most people don't understand that exposure to mice can cause asthma to develop in kids and can also trigger asthma attacks. We should not be tolerating mice in our facilities. They also carry a long list of pathogens and can cause serious food safety risks. Uh, they can cause fires. Uh, they chew on all sorts of things, including electrical wires uh, and can cause short circuits and experts estimate that as many as 25% of fires of unknown origins are related to rodent problems. They also have tremendous reproductive capacity. So really important that you don't let them get started. For example, rats, uh, a young rat can reproduce within eight weeks of its birth and produce 10 to 12, uh, what they call pups uh, per litter. Uh, so if you let rodents get started in and around your facility, you can have enormous populations uh, before long. And the other benefits to managing rodents is that many of the things that we do to keep rodents out of our facility is also reduce energy costs by sealing gaps that um, hot air and air conditioning escape through. So lots of benefits for uh, ridding your facilities of rodent problems. So one of the first things that we need to do when dealing with a rodent problem is to identify what the issue is. Uh, is it a roof rat? Is it a Norway rat? Uh, is it a, a mouse? Uh, or maybe it's a combination. Uh, often uh, when uh, people in facilities will report a problem, um, they might report it as a rat problem uh, when really it's just a, it's a mouse problem. And because of the differences in behaviors uh, between these different species, uh, we need to know uh, what the problem is because the management is very different. For example, mice are very happy uh, to live in our homes and facilities with us. Uh, and so um, we're looking for uh, nesting sites inside the facility. Uh, rats, on the other hand, will typically visit a facility, but they prefer to live outdoors. Uh, and uh, the Norway rat uh, typically in burrows in the ground, uh, whereas the, the roof rat uh, will often uh, build a nest um, up in a tree next to the facility. So really important that we identify what the problem is. Uh, and of course, with rodents, the droppings uh, can be a big clue. Uh, and so we can look at the size and the shape of the dropping uh, and tell immediately whether we're dealing with uh, mice or roof rats or Norway rats because they have very distinctive droppings. You'll notice that the droppings are pointed on the end. Uh, and so that's characteristic of, of mammals that have an anal sphincter um, as opposed to cockroaches, for example, 
uh, can have droppings that are the same size as mouse droppings, but those ends are squared off. So we can tell a lot just by looking at the droppings that rodents are leaving behind. Next slide. So if nothing happens when you report problems, that's a big problem. It means that you've got a problem with your pest management system. So many facilities will use their electronic work order system to manage uh, pest complaints. And uh, we, we highly recommend that. So just like you would report uh, a leak or a broken window through your work order system, uh, it works really well typically to report pest problems through that work order system as well. Uh, but you need to see a response. Um, and when it comes to rodents, really important that you see a quick response to the issues that get reported. Uh, and sometimes that's not happening because of a breakdown in communications. Uh, it might be the person that's reviewing the work order reports doesn't know what to do with a, a pest report, uh, or they're reporting it up the chain or reporting it out to a contractor uh, and they're not responding. So. Number one, you should have a way to report pest problems and you see, should see some action as a result. So when we're talking about uh, rodents, we're looking at droppings or this other picture here that you see uh, is a chewed up piece of food trash. Um, and so many of us uh, recognize uh, signs of pest problems uh, related to these and really important uh, that people feel empowered uh, to report these into the system uh, and that you see a response and a resolution. So not only you know, when, where, and what uh, in terms of signs of pests, but really important that you also report conditions that are conducive to pest problems. So the pictures in these presentations are from walkthroughs of healthcare facilities that we've done. So these are conditions that we've actually found in healthcare facilities and really important that these get resolved. So here on the left, uh, we have a picture of food debris uh, and other trash piling up in a corner outside. And this is just ideal rat conditions. So rats love to to nest uh, and find food uh, in piles of debris like this. Uh, and uh, a good friend of mine um, who works in a school system in Texas, what he says about this is, if you're feeding them and giving them homes, you don't have pests, you have pets, and you don't want pet rats or mice in your facility. The picture on the right uh, is a very cluttered storage area. Again, it gives rodents cover. Uh, mice and rats uh, will uh, nest very comfortably in a situation like this. Uh, it becomes impossible to inspect an area like this to see what might be going on under all that debris. Uh, and certainly it's impossible to keep that clean. Uh, and you end up with issues, uh, rodent feces, and urine uh, building up, uh, moisture issues uh, leading to mold, uh, and all other sorts of uh, indoor air quality problems that you create uh, when you let situations like this continue. So very important to get rid of clutter and keep things clean. Another important strategy uh, is to reduce harborage. This is particularly important for rats outdoors. So you see on the left, uh, you see vegetation that's intentionally planned to leave the ground exposed. Uh, and of course, rodents, when they're outside, uh, their primary concern is avoiding exposure to predators uh, that might uh, attack them outdoors. And so when you have conditions like you have on the right, a piece of plywood left on the ground, uh, you're encouraging rodents uh, and also insects to hang out uh, under that board. Um, same thing with the vegetation that completely obscures the ground on the right. Uh, so when we do our walkthroughs, we dive into situations like that and often uncover uh, hidden rodent burrows where the rodents are, are very happy 
uh, to live uh, protected from exposure to potential predators. Indoors as well. Next slide here. We wanna be sure that we don't create harborage uh, and places that become impossible to clean. So, so often we'll see uh, milk crates or pallets uh, in storage areas uh, in hospitals. And it's always a struggle to find enough room to store things. And certainly it's a great idea to get things up off the floor so you're not uh, creating potential moisture and mold issues with cardboard boxes sitting on the floor. But when you prop them up on, on pallets or milk crates like this, you create habitat for rodents and insects. And so their mice are very happy to uh, go out, search for food and bring it back uh, and uh, nesting material uh, and create uh, nests uh, underneath these milk crates. Uh, and uh, uh, before you know it, uh, you've got a mouse population living in your facility and they're protected, you can't see them. So people coming through to inspect don't see them. People coming through to clean don't clean that area and you end up with, with dust and rodent debris back in there. Same thing with upholstered furniture. So we really try to discourage that uh, in, in all facilities. Um, you end up uh, with cavities, including under the cushions, but then under uh, that cloth, that fabric, that stretched over the frame of the upholstered furniture underneath the cushions uh, is also an ideal habitat uh, for mice to live in. And you'll often find mouse nests under uh, and inside your upholstered furniture uh, and they'll come up uh, underneath um, those uh, cushions, the backrests and so forth, and chew a hole through the fabric and live up in that uh, insulated um, cushion area. Uh, it's very warm and comfortable for them. Next slide. So another key uh, for maintenance people to be aware of uh, is preventing access. So mice can squeeze through gaps a quarter an inch uh, in diameter uh, and then rats only need a half inch. If they can squeeze their skull through, they can squeeze their body through. And so we always want to be on the lookout for those size gaps. And here on the left, we can see that gap in this revolving door. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we can see that certainly large gap up into the suspended ceiling. Uh, we can see a small gap there with the roll up door. We can see that somebody has punched through uh, the drain grate there to make holes for pipes to penetrate. Uh, and those drain grates pr provide a very important service in keeping rats from accessing your facility through the sewer system. So rats will often infest sewer systems um, in, in cities and in towns and rural areas. It's ideal habitat for them. The reason why we have those grates on the drains is to keep rats from being able to come up into the facility. Uh, and then when we uh, destroy the grate like that, uh, we lose that protection. So we don't wanna be doing that. And then certainly the, the bottom picture shows what we often find when we go out to outbuildings uh, in facilities. Uh, it might be a, a workshop or storage um, and it's not uh, well-maintained uh, and you find uh, places like this where rodents can thrive and also things like raccoons and possum and feral cats uh, you can find in situations like this. So both for our main facilities and our outbuildings, including temporary facilities, we want to make sure that they're buttoned up and are not providing access or habitat for pests. Next slide. And then for our housekeeping professionals, really important that we limit access to food and water for pests. So picture on the left, um, very common situation. Uh, it's nice here that there's equipment that's mounted on rollers, but as we can see, that equipment is not moved out regularly enough during cleaning. Uh, it's not cleaned, uh, it's coated with grease. Uh, and that area back in that corner 
becomes very difficult to clean. Uh, and it requires getting down on your hands and knees and, and reaching back in there to clean that out. Uh, but that's plenty of food for a mouse for a month there. So really important that we get those areas resolved uh, and improve our storage um, practices uh, so that we don't have uh, racks pushed up against the corner, uh, creating those areas that, that can't be uh, cleaned very easily. Trash handling areas are also uh, very important to keep clean. Um, up on the uh, top picture on the right there, we see the trash compactor and accumulation of um, spilled food and other trash underneath it. Um, that becomes a great nesting habitat for rats as well as food sources. Uh, and then down below, uh, we have our dumpsters uh, with no covers on them. Uh, and the rats are likely in there every night uh, getting all the food that they can handle. Next slide. So when it comes to resolving an active rodent problem, uh, there are lots of good strategies that we can use. The primary strategy that's used in most facilities is a preventative approach using a rodenticide bait uh, in these plastic um, tamper resistant uh, bait stations. Uh, and they're placed at regular intervals all around the facility. Uh, and every month, uh, the contractor comes through and pulls those rodenticide blocks out uh, and throws them in the trash. Um, while uh, monitoring for rodents outdoors uh, is highly recommended uh, and very important, we don't recommend just routine use of rodenticide. Uh, what we have available to us are non-toxic bait blocks. So in the upper left, uh, you see those two blocks on that rod in the station. Um, we recommend using a non-toxic block in those stations and only replacing those with rodenticide when there's active feeding showing up. There's no reason for us to be using rodenticide in all of those stations and putting it, sending it to the landfill every month uh, when we can be using non-toxic uh, rodent bait blocks. We don't want to be using loose rodenticide anywhere inside or outside the facilities, except perhaps in rodent burrows where we use pellets uh, and feed them into the burrow using a hose and a funnel uh, so that they're not carried out of the burrow easily uh, by the rodent. Loose rodent stations need to be maintained on a regular basis. Too often, uh, we open up these stations during our walkthroughs and uh, find rodents using them as nest boxes. And so typically your facility is hiring a pest management professional to come in. One of the services they provide is putting these rodent stations out around the building and they're charging you every month for checking and maintaining those. Uh, and often that doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, and it's not helping you at all unless those are checked, uh, the monitoring blocks are checked, um, and then replaced with rodenticide if there's feeding activity. These stations also need to be secured to the ground. Uh, they, uh, by law, uh, should not be able to be picked up. So often uh, they're staked to the ground uh, with a stake and a wire, um, or they're mounted on top of a concrete block uh, to make it uh, very difficult or impossible for a child to pick up and shake um, those boxes and potentially get exposed to the rodenticide. So we do want to use these stations, but we want to use non-toxic monitoring blocks and replace those with rodenticide only when we see activity. Next slide. So traps are a uh, number one strategy for inside the building. Uh, we don't want to use rodenticide inside a building. Um, traps are very effective. Uh, my favorite are the type with a big paddle uh, and with a, uh, a double trip lever there. Uh, this brand is, is Ness uh, and you don't have to handle uh, the bar that actually comes down to kill the rodent because you've got that other trip handle that's uh, upright in these pictures here. Um, the big paddle makes it very sensitive. 
uh, to uh, rodents that are coming to feed on the bait that you put on that uh, in that hole in the center of the paddle. Uh, and they're very effective. The most important thing when using these traps is to use a lot of them. So uh, when we find a uh, um, rodent problem inside a facility, we consider that an emergency. The way you want to handle that is to put out dozens of traps in the affected area and check those every day uh, until uh, you have several days without any captures. So it's typically very easy to completely eliminate a rodent problem inside a building using these snap traps uh, in a matter of days if you're using enough of them and you're checking and rebating and replacing those daily until you're not getting any more captures. We like to use these cardboard trap covers. They're available for both the large uh, rat snap traps and the smaller mouse snap traps. Uh, they, they hide the traps uh, and the captures. Uh, they also uh, prevent people from reaching underneath something to grab something and end up getting uh, hurt by the, the trap. So um, they're, uh, they're really helpful. Glute boards we don't recommend. They're less humane. Um, it takes a long time for rodents to, dry, to die on these uh, glue boards. Uh, it can be very distracting for people working in the facility if there's a, a rodent um, slowly dying on one of these glue boards and making all sorts of distress sounds. Um, the, uh, the live traps that you see um, in the upper right there, uh, we don't recommend. Uh, sometimes uh, rodents will be trap shy and uh, we're not able to get them with the snap traps. We might try something like this, uh, like the live trap, uh, but it needs to be checked every day. Too often I'll go into facility uh, and the pest control provider has put these traps in there and they come and check them once a week. And when I open them up, uh, there's one or more dead rodents in there uh, and ants and cockroaches feeding on the dead rodents. Um, so you don't want to have snap traps or um, live traps in a facility unless they're checked on a very regular daily basis uh, to remove those captures. Really important when you're using traps is that you push them up against the wall. So usually I've got two mouse traps or two rat traps in one of those cardboard boxes. The uh, surface of the box that you see there with the diagram on it, the um, that, that part of the box is pushed up against the wall. You know, rodents will run along uh, walls, the wall and floor junction, and you want that entry hole to be right in line with the wall. Um, that makes the most effective. Next slide. So finally, it's really important to clean up carefully after rodents. Um, rodents are responsible for uh, lots of different diseases. Uh, including uh, mice and hantavirus. Uh, it's a real risk, especially uh, in some of our Western states. Uh, it can be fatal uh, and people can contract hantavirus as they're cleaning up droppings and inhaling that uh, virus infected uh, dust from the droppings. So the CDC has a great uh, protocol for cleaning up after droppings and it involves uh, sanitizing and disinfecting of uh, that area before you get in there uh, and start to clean that up. I use hydrogen peroxide uh, and vinegar, uh, one after the other, uh, and then uh, soak the area uh, with those liquids uh, and then come back 10 minutes later and clean that up. And by then 99% of the virus particles have been killed by those uh, disinfectants. Okay, next slide. So just wanna end here with some resources. So we have a training module online uh, that your facility managers might appreciate participating in. Uh, and it's a online self-paced learning and a certificate is available once you complete that training. We also have a program called Green Shield Certified uh, and we frequently are called out to help in other facilities to troubleshoot uh, persistent pest problems uh, that the um, service provider has not been able to resolve. Uh, 
and much like our facility walkthroughs uh, in our uh, IPM and healthcare facilities project, we provide a comprehensive written report uh, and support to implement the recommendations afterwards. There's also certification for facilities available and for your pest control providers through this program. And then finally, pest prevention by design uh, is a great document. Uh, if you're doing any renovation or construction, uh, it focuses on those aspects of designing uh, that new construction or renovation to help keep pests out uh, and uh, prevent pest problems long term. Uh, and that was developed by the San Francisco City County Department of uh, Environment uh, with a, uh, a large group of professionals, both IPM design professionals from around the country. So next steps, sign up for the free bi-monthly newsletter and fact sheets uh, by emailing uh, Berlin at MarylandPestNet.org. Um, take a look at the model policies for IPM um, and other resources related to uh, COVID uh, disinfection uh, and least toxic pesticides on our webpage. Uh, and then contact us about our free services that include the walkthroughs and reporting. So, and finally, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we welcome your questions and please use this link here to send your comments or questions uh, and we'll get back to you with, with answers in just a few days. So thanks so much for your participation in the program today and I hope that you'll find this information helpful uh, both at work um, and also at home to prevent pest problems and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again.